Hello everyone and welcome back to Animation Pilgrimage, the show where Tennille and I take a look at every single theatrically released animated film in chronological order. I'm Whitney. I'm Tennille. And today we are in 1962 and we are watching Joseph the Dreamer. Mm-hmm. Last week we said we were going to watch a different movie, but whatever, we'll go back to that one, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back to it, but in the meantime, we watched this movie. Which and... is the first... <laughs> Israeli film, animated film, we've watched for Animation Pilgrimage, and the first one made, and was also made and directed by Yom Graus. Yeah, our one of our favorite directors <laughs> on Animation Pilgrimage. We've, That's a lie. <laughs> we, we've loved every movie that they've made. I think they've. I think all of his films have been like our least favorite. Of every year? Yeah. Yeah. So, if you're watching these in uh, chronological order... This is the first time we're talking about him. Uh, but just know that he makes a lot of films down the line. and Because this is also his first film. Yeah. Yeah. This is the very first film he did mm -hmm. in is Israel. Now, I'm, I'm confused because he makes films in Australia. He has a animation company in Australia. Mm-hmm. Is, Why don't I... Tell me more about Yoram. I don't understand what's going on here. Yeah, because, you know, move? I think I realized that when we've covered him before, I don't know that I ever looked at his Wikipedia page. Okay. So why don't we talk about the man himself, Yarm Gross. Um, it's going to be more interesting than the movie. Yeah, I mean, this is a retelling of the biblical story of Joseph, which, I mean, some of our viewers might not know, but mm -hmm. we'll go over it. We'll get bit. into it. Let's talk about Yaram. He was born in Poland um, in the mid 1920s. Okay. Survived through World War II. It never, I, I never saw anything on his. Wikipedia page saying that he himself is Jewish, but his family is definitely Jewish. Okay. So I don't know if he, like, left the faith or whatever, but his family was definitely Jewish, and they survived World War II by moving, according to Wikipedia, over 72 times. I mean, I believe it. Yeah. Like, that's... Uh, that's just a very, like, sobering number, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then he moved to Israel in 1950 and worked as a cameraman for, like, newsreels and documentaries and stuff like that. Okay. And then this film, his brother was also a filmmaker, and this film was commissioned by the Israeli Film Commission. Uh, they had a crew of five people <laughs> to work on this. Okay. And uh, he worked on a couple of films while he was in Israel. But then in 1967, he, his wife, his family moved to Australia. And that is when they started the company there that would later go on to make the kangaroo. Dot, dot kangaroo, the kangaroo and all of those others. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was wondering that too. I was like, why Israel? I don't... Like, this just, because we only knew him as an Australian director, it just seemed so... I didn't know he so, came from somewhere else. Yeah, it just seemed so out of left field. But, you know, looking at all the history and, and what he's been through in his life, it's like, yeah, okay, that that makes sense. All right, that makes more sense. Yeah. I want to say thank you to Orbited Star for finding this movie for us. Thank you so much. Anyways, this like we said earlier, is Joseph the Dreamer. It is a story from the Bible. So known by multiple faiths, because I think it's in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah it's a, definitely the Old it's Testament. It's a Genesis story. Wow, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, it, I honestly got to say... For anyone who doesn't know, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. So that means it's like the oldest stories. The oldest stories about creation and other things. Yeah, this is this is a story specifically in the Bible to explain why the Israelites are in Egypt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Mm-hmm. 
That's why it's often told alongside the story of Moses. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyways. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, this is one of those stories that... Like, this feels like a film that my church would have had growing up, and I would have fallen asleep. You would have asleep. watched it in Sunday school. Yeah, I would have fallen asleep to it in Sunday school watching this because it was pretty boring and the animation was fairly lackluster, probably because it was made by five people in 1962 in a country that had not made animated films before. Yeah. So it's very simplistic. And as a child, I would have been bored to tears. And another thing to note is that apparently the space that they were given to make this movie in was basically just a garage. It was so hot during the day and they had to have these like camera lights turned on. Mm -hmm. They could not film during the day so everything had to be done at night like with all the doors open <laughs> <laughs> okay. to this little building and yeah like it, it sounds like it was a <laughs> not a fun filming experience yeah it's a stop motion film mm -hmm. so anyways the story of joseph the dreamer mm -hmm. is about joseph who is the youngest of i think 12 sons of one particular dude and he's his dad's... Jacob. Jacob. Dude, I don't remember. Yeah. He's his dad's favorite. All of his brothers hate him for it. He also has dreams of all of his brothers bowing down to him, which doesn't make his brothers like him anymore. No. Uh, so they beat the crap out of him, throw him in a well, and then some uh, slave traders come along, and they sell him off to the slave traders who mm -hmm. take him to Egypt. In the meantime, they also tell... Their dad, that, oh, he was killed by a wild beast. Oh, this is terrible. Look, we found his shirt. It's covered in blood mm -hmm. from a sheep. But we're not going to tell our dad this. Uh, and then his younger brother, you know how I said he was the youngest brother? But now the book, con the Bible contradicts itself and says there's a new younger brother. It doesn't contradict itself. It's that there was Joseph who was born of... Rachel, which was Jacob's favorite wife, because Jacob had many wives, which is why Joseph is the favorite child, because they thought that Rachel wasn't able to have kids. So she had Joseph. And then later on, she has Benjamin, a second child, who also quickly becomes Jacob's other favorite child. And then becomes his favorite child when he thinks Joseph is dead. Right. Anyways, Joseph is now in Egypt, and he's sold off to a dude named Potiphar, and he quickly shows that he is a useful and willing slave. Mm -hmm. uh, and, like, he gets more and more power in the household, and Potiphar's wife is like, I'm gonna bone that slave because I own him. And he, and Joseph's like, no way, dude, that's against my religion. And then she's like, all right, I'm gonna tell my husband that you tried to... Uh, attack me and then Potiphar's like how dare you dude and then he gets thrown in jail and that's all skimmed over in this movie for in like a sentence yeah that whole thing with Potiphar not even really done no it's done as like a little narration over hieroglyphic images yeah which like I kind of get like you need to cut some stuff down for time but that's like a pretty important part of Joseph's story. Yeah, you know, it's Joseph actually like... showing that he can he's competent with numbers and like working. Yeah, I it, to me I've always felt like this is a part of the story where you're supposed to be like, okay, Joseph is actually a very special boy who is good at his job or whatever. Yeah, he is special and but more they just than just special for special sake. Skip over it. Okay. Anyways, he's in jail with a couple of other dudes, and uh, one of the dudes is like, I had this weird dream I don't understand, and Joseph's like, I got this. And he interprets the dream, saying that he'll be freed from jail in three days and get his job back. And guess what? That comes true. So, it also, the, this movie skips over the other person who is in jail. He is sitting right there, but Joseph does not interpret his dream. Yeah, Because this other guy's dream is that he's going to be executed in three days. Yeah. Which also happens. Yeah. Anyways, a couple years pass, and now the pharaoh mm -hmm. has a dream that he doesn't understand about seven 
starving cows eating seven fat cows. And he's like, what does this mean? And oh my goodness, we spent like half the movie on this dream. Of just slowly watching cows walk out of the ground. Each and every cow we watch get out of the ground, walk a little bit, stop, and, and then, then the, the next, next one. Cow. So there's 14 cows slowly waddling themselves on screen. And then they all fight each other where they just kind of like threw the toys on top of each other and <laughs> shuffle them around a bit. Yeah. It's like, all right, you get the point across. Yeah. Anyways. Luckily, they don't do the Pharaoh's second dream. Yeah, he has another dream where it's the same thing except with wheat stalks. Yeah. I don't know what a fat wheat stalk versus what a skinny wheat stalk is supposed to look like. <laughs> I don't know. Because that's how it was always described, too. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, what does that even mean? Because if it was like a healthy wheat stalk versus like a sickly one, like that makes sense. But mm. yeah. Anyways, Joseph is called in and he interprets the dreams and the Pharaoh's like, oh, that sounds great. Because it's the interpretation of the dream. You're going to have seven years of bountiful, beautiful harvests. Amazing. And then you're going to have seven years of terrible famine and drought. Right. So you should save up during those first seven years. Mm -hmm. And then in the second seven years, you'll be fine. You can hand the food out to the people and Egypt will prosper. Mm -hmm. And so they do that. And you know what? The Pharaoh liked Joseph so much with the interpretation of the stream, he's in charge of all the money stuff, or all the food stuffs now. Mm -hmm. And so seven years passed, and now we're in the drought season. The famine. The famine. And Joseph's brothers come because they're starving, and they're like, please, we need food. And Joseph is like, no. Well, they don't realize it's Joseph. <coughs> <coughs> That's an important part. Yeah. He doesn't look like himself because he's, you know, like, at least nine years older at this point. Well, yeah, it's been basically a decade. The brothers figured he's dead, and, yeah, Joseph is in a high seat of power, looking more like an Egyptian, like wearing clothes and clothes mm -hmm. that are part of Egypt and stuff rather than what he used to look like. Anyways, Joseph plays tricks on them. Uh, he does give them the food, though. And then uh, he demands that the next time they come back, they have to bring the youngest son, Benjamin, for some reason, because they, they talk about <laughs> their dad and how their dad is sad and old and lost a son and and now he has a different favorite son. Mm -hmm. And so Joseph's like, all right, bring the favorite son next time you want food. And so they do. And then Joseph plants his silver chalice in Benjamin's sack of food when they go back. And he's like, how dare you steal from me? Mm -hmm. Even though he did it himself. And then they're like, oh, please don't. Take one of us. Like, take any of us instead. You can't take Benjamin because he's our father's favorite and our father would die. Uh -huh. The moral of the story being that uh, the brothers have learned their lesson. Of jealousy and... Whatever. Yeah. And so Joseph forgives them. And he's like, actually, hey, it's me, your bro. I'm actually not dead. And look, those prophecy dreams I had forever ago of you bowing down to me. Look, that came true. That came <laughs> true. <laughs> Anyways, go get dad and all the wives and stuff and come here and live in this land. Yeah, come live in Egypt. The end. Mm-hmm. That's the story. You know, I've never really sat and, like, thought about this story ever Nobody comes been, out on top in this one. And like, like I like this is not a banger. <laughs> like of all it the does not slap. Uh Joseph actually is canceled. <laughs> like of all the Bible stories to retell a million times, why do people go for this one? Um, I don't understand. Well, one I mean, Joseph is kind of a Gary Stew. He has, like, these prophetic dreams. He's a super special boy. You know, like, I think people We even relate. skipped over the moments where he just single-handedly kills lions. <laughs> like, people, people want to relate to Joseph. So I think that's part of it. Has women throwing themselves at him? Yeah. And, 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 and. If we look at it through an American lens, obviously this was made in 
um, is real. But I know there's been several American adapta adaptations of the Joseph story. Mm -hmm. I think that from an American lens, we like the idea of Joseph being able to pull himself up by his bootstraps and rise above slavery and... You know, then he becomes the most important boy in the land. Yeah, okay, I see that Like, now. yeah, there's, there, there's a reason. I don't like that reason, but there is certainly a reason. Mm-hmm. Would I recommend people watch this? I don't know. I mean, it's interesting that it's, um... It's the first movie from Israel. Yeah, and it's got parts both at the beginning and the end that are spoken in... Israeli, Arabic, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. Hebrew, I don't know. But I'm like curious if those were directly from like original scriptures or something. Like that's cool. I will say, uh, there are characters that talk in this movie, and then there's a narrator. And yes. the narrator so... only speaks in Bible verses. Yeah. He, the narrator literally is quoting the Bible whenever they speak. Mm hmm I don't know which version of the Bible. But... One of the English versions, so, like, you yeah. know. Uh, so that, with that in mind, I think that the version of this film that we watched was the re-released Australian version in 2002. Because that had uh, English narration done by Keith Scott. Okay. I guess it would make sense that the original was not in English. English. Yeah. Uh, this film was originally shown at the Keynes Film Festival. I was hoping to, like, win the grand prize of that. It didn't, but it did end up winning a lot of awards. Okay. Well, year. I mean, hey, theatrically released animated films, the first of its kind for the country, mm -hmm. usually looks pretty good for, like, a resume. Yeah. I mean... There is something to be said, though, about how, in a lot of ways, this film is going for the same kind of aesthetic and emotional importance as uh, Sri Lanka films that we've watched. Mm -hmm. They're kind of so similar. I wonder if, if Yarm Gross ever watched any of those. Yeah, I don't know. I will say there is a kind of magic to uh, Sri Lanka's films where... Sri Lanka or Iji Trinka? Iji Trinka, I think. I'm, I'm pronouncing the name wrong. Okay. Um, where, like, his puppets, even though they couldn't use expressions, he uses the, the camera work the and camera the lighting work is... to express so much. Yeah, Iji Trinka, fantastic camera work. Like, mm -hmm. very simplistic puppets, but, like, he gets the mood across very well. This had very basic cameras. And it and... tried a couple of times, especially at the beginning. There's a couple of... There's, like, a scene in particular with Joseph and Jacob where, like, Jacob is touching his son's face and being like, oh, you know, my precious baby boy. Uh, but, like, the... Because the puppets are so basic... And the camera work is not selling the mood. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't come across the way it wants to. Yeah. Like, you can see what it's trying to do. It's just not achieving that. Correct. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought that was a, a fun thing to bring up. Because we have films that we can kind of directly compare to each other. Absolutely. I will say uh, one other... One other knock against this movie is... Uh -huh. um, oh, there's a lot of bug-eyed puppets. There's a lot of bug-eyed puppets, especially for the villain characters. Yeah. And the slave traders all look not great. Okay. <laughs> they, Here's another thing I've always I'm, had. Like, I'm going to little... say, like, vaguely racist, but, like, it's also a movie being made in Israel, so I'm confused why... Well... Another thing that always gets under my skin about whenever I see adaptations of Joseph is that, like, somehow the most diversity you will find in the cast will be Jacob and his sons. Like, there'll be kids with red hair, there'll be white kids, there'll be black kids, there'll be brown kids. 
blonde. Blonde, and then like beautiful white male looking Joseph, which I'm just like, oh, why? Why? And then like all the rest of the cast is very like samey brown person. And I'm like, okay, like that kind of makes sense, but like, why? Why is Jacob's family so so diverse? So diverse. That doesn't make any sense. It's like I realize he has lots of different wives, but like, what? It's What's still going on? Fifty percent of the genes are coming from one man. Yeah, they would all look gen- somewhat similar. Generally, kind of like that one man. You know, like brothers. You know, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And this movie does that, too. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Anyways, I think that that about wraps up our thoughts on this movie. Yeah. So uh, join us back here next time as we do go back and watch that other movie. We'll be watching The Czech Year. Yes. From 1947. Yes. E.G. Trinka, Czechoslovakia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>